Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Decoding AQ. With me today, I have David Ogilvie. He's a CEO, he's a non-executive director, and actually he is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Resilience Development Co. So on a mission to help people work better, feel better, and live better. So welcome, David. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite, Ross. I, I appreciate it. I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation because I think we've got a lot in common, actually. Could be indeed. And I think it's been quite a theme at the moment around resilience mm. and how that applies to our modern society, our life, what we're finding ourselves in. But why don't you start, give a little bit of your background because you had 20 years in financial services, in banking at HBOS, Bank of Scotland, Lloyds, and then you know left the city to go to somewhere new to do something different. So give us a little bit of, of background, David, to, to your journey so far. Yeah, I'm going to give you a, a potted history, right? I'm going to go take you right back. So a lot of people think that this is a, a, a Newcastle accent, right? But it, it's not. I'm actually from Halifax, which is why I started off working from Halifax. I'm actually just a kid from a council estate. So I've seen some pretty, some pretty amazing things, and I don't mean amazing good. So, for example, I lost my best friend when he was 19. I've been homeless, um, so I understand what it's like to sleep out and sleep very rough. Uh, I've seen, you know, the, the impact of alcohol, drugs, that kind of thing. Um, and I wanted to be a social worker. That's what I always wanted to be. I wanted to help people, right? I wanted to be a social worker. Um, and then my auntie, who was a social worker, just before I went to do a degree, said to me, why don't you go get some life experience, David? And what she meant was, um, that's a tough job. And you might not be cut out for it. So I went to work for Halifax, Halifax Building Society at the time, and basically worked there for 20 years. So I started off as a cashier in a branch, right? Just a very small branch at the outskirts of town. I think there were six of us, maybe seven of us. Uh, and I learned my trade and my craft there and how to deal with people. Um, and then up to 10 years ago, I was the customer management director for UK and international wealth for Lloyd's Banking Group. So teams of hundreds of people working across the world and my point is point of all of that uh, Ross is I've seen a lot of change and seen a lot of transition and I've been through a lot of change and a lot of transition you know right sizing restructuring all that stuff but I've also been on the other end of it closing offices down in Switzerland all that kind of thing so I've seen a lot seen a lot of change and I was all I was always a good good leader right because I cared about people and the reason I'm saying that, it's not because I'm up my own backside, I have to be careful what I say there. Um, it's because looking back, actually, I wasn't that great. I was the kind of leader which was parachuted into places to get things done. If you had a problem, I was going to fix it. If you had a target to hit, we were going to hit it, right? And if you didn't like it, you were on the wrong team. And it didn't matter how long, how long it would take, um, one of us was going to lose. And it wouldn't be me, it'd be you. You can probably hear the overtones of it all, right? The overtones of it all. Um, so I came to Jersey 18 years ago into a senior position. Uh, I was 30, in my 30s, right? And my wife came with me. Um, and if you move from Halifax, which is a small town, to Jersey, which is a financial centre, it's an island, nine by five, it's very affluent. In a nutshell, my wife got incredibly ill incredibly ill we had two kids she got ill uh, and in the meantime i'm going through h boss 2008 i'm going through all the financial crisis i'm working in lloyd's i'm commuting two to three days a week from the island to geneva um, or to lloyd's um and basically what happened is she, she became very ill now emma's part of the company she's a director of resilience development co background is psychology and counseling so it was like talking to, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, it was like talking to a crazy sane person because she'd say, I'm not taking those tablets because this is the effect. And looking back, it was very difficult, right? It was very, very difficult. Nobody knew. I didn't tell anybody apart from my line manager who um, was really brilliant. He said, if you need to be at home because you're not sure what's going to happen, then we'll set you up. 
um, in Jersey so that you don't have to commute as much. It was really good. There are some people in life that you just look back on and you go, without them, he was definitely, definitely one of them. And then, just to bring us finally up to speed, my wife said to me, why don't you come on our program, David? Because it was my wife's company. Because basically what she did, Ross, was um, because she got very ill, and I mean very ill, she went back to her first year of psychology and said, there must be things that I can do to help myself. And she formed this company, only it wasn't a company, it was a social enterprise. And it was called Resilience Matters. And what she did was amazing because she took um, a theory and made it into everyday skills. So she said to me, you know, why don't you, why don't you come on this program? And I remember saying, I remember my exact words to her. It was, Emma, what can you teach me? I've just spent a week at the London uh, School of Economics with peers around the world. And I've got lots of letters after my name. And I know lots of about change. What can you teach me? And we've been together 25 years. So she just laughed at me and smiled at me, Ross, and said, why don't you come along and see it, right? Then to cut a long story short, that's how somebody who was top talent in Lloyd's Banking Group, 20 years in a career, um, exceeding expectations and running big teams, suddenly went in and handed in his notice. Went in and handed in his notice. It was a, a light bulb moment to me. What she'd managed to do was take the theory that we see in psychology and leadership and make it into really practical skills. And I suddenly said, do you know what? We've got to get this out to the world. Um, 10 years later, that's what we're doing. That's what you've been doing. It's so fascinating, isn't it? Where we, when we recall and we look back and we're connecting these dots, we have various pivotal moments. There's mm. experiences, there's people we meet along the journey, along the road, a, a good boss, a bad boss, yeah. our version of ourselves throughout different chapters in our lives. And then this moment where you saw quite a significant change, you'd got to one point of who David was and who would David be next as a result of Emma, your wife's input of things. Mm. What, what was it you were either thankful to say goodbye to of that old world? And what were you thankful of saying hello to in that new opportunity, in that moment? What were those things that were um, happening, if you can remember, sort of nine, ten years ago? Yeah, I was really thankful. Looking back, working for Lloyd's Banking Group, right, uh, they, were, they were brilliant absolutely brilliant so for example um i went to the olympics with my son because lots of people nominated me as a great leader um and when i look back it was people and lloyd's bank are very progressive some of the issues i hear about diversity inclusion um out and out sexism I was, 10 years ago i was working in teams that were very diverse very inclusive Right. So it's the people and the exposure to people and the learning. And often, often I, I mean, I was 30 when I took my big first senior job. And often what would happen is people would, I'd send my CV and people would say, oh, I expect you to be older. Not so much now because I'm graying, but, but definitely there. I'm really grateful for the experience of change, but the people side of it. So I've managed big change programs and worked with some really clever program managers and big big um, change programs, but it's the exposure to people and ideas and working alongside other other people. My, one of my biggest strengths is I'm very curious. If I'm not careful, I can overplay it and it, it can become as very intense, right? But I'm very curious. So looking back, I'm grateful for all of that experience and the roles and the people that allowed me to express my strength. I never saw, knew it like that because I'd not, I'd, I wasn't part of this company then. Right. And I, what I'm really grateful for now at the moment is the, the people I work with, Ross, there are four of us. We're all very different. And the impact that we have, we're very different because we measure things. So we measure stress. We measure anxiety. Guess what happens after working with us, no matter who you are. They get, yeah, they go down, down and you get better. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, that that gets measured, gets improved, especially if you report on it and actually have some interventions. Now, there are many things that we have in life. Actually, before I go on that, something that was interesting is the consistency of people. So in your story of the, the two worlds, and even yeah. you know that first world was full of lots of change, lots of shift, different roles, different programs. It was still people that made your light shine and yeah. your energy sing, and the same is true now. 
And I remember a conference a few years ago, David, where um, the guy was interviewing uh, Tony Robbins and he said, you know, everybody's talking about change. You know, what's what's the future going to hold? You know, and we're trying to predict the future, trying to create the future. And he said, you know, one of the most profound things is what isn't going to change. Yeah. And if we can get a handle on what isn't going to change, then we can build from there. And there's certain things, whether it might be certain values, certain beliefs about people that we can have as an anchor thread throughout and then allow the environmental issues or the different aspirations or ambitions that we might have through living a curious life. And um, so my, my, uh, it just made me think of that, David, which I, I appreciate because trying to live in this paradox of past, today, and future can be boggling sometimes, can't it, for how we navigate. And coming to this world that you're now in of resilience mm. and working in a practical sense, tell me a little bit more of, you know, that happened for you 10 years ago where you were going through a situation, you said, we've got to get this out to the world. That mm. was the sort of language you, you used. What do you mean by this? What is it that you've got to get out to the world? Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good question, right? So basically, we would define ourselves as a creator and leaders in skills based resilience. Skills based resilience. So I had a good look at your um, AQ stuff, right? And in there, you talk about hope and thinking style. So for example, you know, well, what is your thinking style? Most people would, would talk about optimism. You just be need to be optimistic, right? So they would just say, and then if you say, well, what does optimistic mean? They'd say, well, it's glass half full or a positive attitude to change. I suspect you and I know that thinking style, when it's referred to by psychologists, is about how you interpret a setback on three levels. How personal is it? How permanent is it? And how pervasive is it, right? So that is a bit of theory. Now, what we do is we measure that, right, in some of our, our um, tools, but we also show you the language patterns and how to understand your, your thinking style, but then how also to recognize that that's a strength and bring in the opposite, increase your situational awareness, so real skills base. Or if you say to somebody, um, you just need to focus, well, how do you do that? Or um, you just need to stop building a mountain out of a molehill. Well, how do you do that? So, for example, we're really passionate about what we do. Obviously, that, I hope that, that's coming across. We took some of our leadership programs and we put them into schools, two schools. We work with them for free. Um, and if you work with us in a school, the parents and the teachers have to come on because it's cultural, right? So, for example, when we are working with students, we always give them one scenario. In fact, I'll, I'll take a step back. We work with the teacher, and what we do is we ask the students to put down something that concerns them into a little hat, right? And we just park it for a moment. Something about school life or work life that concerns them. And then we get put them in a circle and we say, right, here's the scenario. You're standing in the lunch queue and somebody you really fancy comes up behind you and you know you're going to break wind. It's going to be really loud. What's the worst thing that can happen? And somebody tells you, and then you got the next person, you go, and then what? And you blow it up out of all proportion. And basically what happens from that scenario is people are rolling around laughing, but you end up dead, literally dead, because you've become homeless and it's the end of the world. And then what we do is we say, right, let's look at it the other way. What is the best possible outcome? And then what? And then what? And then what? They end up getting married. And then you, you've got the two extremes. You've brought in humor. And then you go to the middle ground and say, so now that we know the extremes, what's the most likely? And then you plan for that, right? What I'm showing you there is a skill that's based around catastrophizing when we take something and blow it out of proportion. That's the theory, but an actual skill that you can repeat, that you can develop, that you can use. It's not lost in a boardroom because if you have to put a financial case together, you'll need to learn that. It's bringing in humor. It's showing you um, things like second, third order consequence, there's so much skill packed in there. But what's really great is the teacher said, I've been trying to talk to my students about catastrophic thinking for about six months. And you've just come in in five minutes, showed them a skill, 
showed them how to manage it between themselves, showed them a skill that would be good in industry. And I've just got a rich insight of everything that they are um, concerned with. That's a skill. So when I talk about this, yeah. I'm talking about getting resilience out there. And there are a few other things I need to throw in there, Ross. Um, one is resilience is not about bouncing back. That belongs in therapy. It comes from kind of, it comes from um, research done in the seventies on the privileged kids, why they bounced back. There's no point bouncing back anymore. We're going so fast in terms of change. If you bounce back from C to B, we've already moved on to A. So resilience is just as much about bouncing forward as it is backwards. And it's about developing physical, mental, and emotional and social strength. They are the elements of resilience. And what we do is we teach people the skills that develop their resilience. In our program, we teach you 65 skills, ranging from stress and how to handle it right through to performance and planning, which is why it's about performance, well-being, and growth. But here's a question about it, if I may, mm -hmm. right? Is when when were you ever given or formally taught the skills to manage the mental, emotional, and social transitions in your life, Ross? Yeah. I think. Mean it's a very good question and it's what often people refer to as life right mm -hmm. you get it through osmosis you get it by just staying alive not yep. dying and from our environment i guess you know we observe others we observe our parents we observe yep. our peers and we morph around what is acceptable what isn't acceptable how we respond yeah. but i think the formal kind of really looking at and equipping with those skills, how to use reflection, how to use mental models of cognitive flexibility or how to breathe, how yep. to, you know, all of these various things that are skills. They're not, you know, something we either have or don't have. We yep. can build them. I, I find it fascinating every time I have conversations with people that are doing this type of work that is centered around building greater awareness for each individual and plotting courses and pathways and direction towards a future self that is more enriched um, and how how profoundly simple it is, but also how challenging that is as well yeah. at the same time. Yeah, because there are, there are a couple of things in there I'm going to tease out. Uh, one is there are three types of resilience, right? One is, is, is what I would call natural resilience. We're all resilient to certain extents and different aspects. We're all resilient. There's even research that shows, shows you can measure some of your resilience genetically, right? So there's that. We all kind of know that. And if I say to a lot of people, if you rate your, your natural resilience between one and 10, why would you put it? Like you've just described, we, we build it through life, right? Most people go, oh, seven, eight. Most people would say that. And then what you've got is you've got that resilience that you learn the hard way through adversity, right? And the thing about that is you don't always learn the hard way. Sometimes it's just hard, right? You have to have the skills that enable you to reflect and look at your past and that adversity through a lens of strength. That's the way that you get meaning. So that's the second way, but it's not guaranteed. And if you say to people, you know, how much of that resilience have you got on a scale of one to 10, then life kicks in and most people go, ooh, eight or nine. The third way is what we call restored resilience. It's a skills base that allows you to flex your resilience when you need it whether you need to go from good to great, whether you need to bounce back, a skills base. And if I say to people, how much of that resilience have you got on a scale of one to 10? We go, what? What do you mean? Because it's generally through the other two. And, and I, I relate it to this. There's a big difference between change and transition. So we would say change is external, Ross. It's a new boss, it's a new process. It's a new, um, it, it's a new IT. It's moving house right? It can generally be pretty sudden and it happens whether you like it or not. That's change. Transition is different. It's internal. It can creep up on you. Uh, it generally comes in three different stages. You probably, I'm teaching you to suggest probably, is you recognize that there's an end, there's a middle bit, and then there's a new bit. And it's that middle bit that's so exciting. That's so exciting. So what we really do is we teach people how to make those mental, emotional, and social transitions. And I think what you'd find interesting is um, we got a counseling psychologist, Johnny's ex special forces. Uh, we're all link qualified and things like that. Change does not fail. There's that, there's that start, isn't there, in organizations? Ch change fails. 70% um, of change fails. 
it's not because of all the great great tools and techniques that we've got and processes. It's people and ability to manage emotion and mindset. And that's what I think is exciting. I think what a lot of organizations do is they, they prepare the road for their people. What we need to be doing and the big shift and what we're pushing hard on is preparing people for the road ahead. Because if we don't get it right, we know what the issues are. And that's what I love about your, your um, that's what I immediately resonated with me when I came across you about helping people navigate change because of the negative impact that it has on people if we don't have these skills. Our, our vision is a little bit kind of simpler. It's just to be not needed because these skills are taught in schools. It's as simple as that. And we think if these skills were taught in schools, we wouldn't have the issues that we have in the home and we wouldn't have the issues that we have in uh, work because we're not just work anymore, are we? Yeah. And often when I'm meeting people and they say, yeah, one of our issues is stress at work, I point out that that issue started a long time ago because people will have seen it at home first. You wear that facade at work. Yeah. And if you've seen it at work, now is the time to act. It's why I love some of the stuff that you do. And I love I, when I had a good look at the, the decoding IQ, I saw a lot of similarities, you know, around ability, character and environment. They're really interesting for me because the other big myth about resilience is everybody thinks it's in your personal control. That's the myth. It's not. As soon as you, it hits your environment, there are things that aren't in, that aren't in your control. And what we do is we tend to work at scale. So we, we, we are at the moment working with 600 adult social care workers and mental health, but we're not working with them on mental health. We're working with them on change. Because if you give people 65 new skills and a shared language, suddenly those things in the culture that they couldn't change, they're now able to change because they have a language and a skill set. And that's how we've won awards for culture. We've won culture awards, team development awards, learning and development awards. The secret is the skills base. Giving people the skills they need to deal with change and to positively adapt. That's how we define resilience, Ross, the ability to positively adapt to change because change can be positive or negative, can't it? Yeah. And I guess, you know, these, these language, the, the words we use and things like, oh, failure or change not working, it's just really, it hasn't met the desired outcomes that we set, you yeah. know, and we, we set these ambitions, we set goals, we set targets, and our connection to those and our likelihood of achieving them are based on the people, are based on those skills. Yeah. and. Our, as you put in your pace model, you know, of positivity, of adaptability, but then confidence and engagement. Yeah. And I think some of the challenge we have where people are sat in an environment, are they doing it through, you know, ambition and wanting to, or is it just compliance? Is it from a state of fear or is it a state from curiosity or excitement? And the yeah. reality is it will be a whole mix of these things. Um, and choosing which one and when is part of our skill part of our intelligence that we go through and I'd, I'd like to dig in a little bit where you know these words we're hearing more of them right we're hearing more because of the context of the environment shifted so we're hearing these words like resilience more and you'll have people who see resilience through their own eyes through their own experience to mm -hmm. academics to practical skills people to everyone and we'll all have a relationship with a word, with an emotion, with a phrase, with something yeah. that's there. And at, at the end, what we're looking for with people, for you to not be needed, for us to make sure no one's left behind, whatever our missions are, when it comes to people and helping them evaluate and improve their, their skills, what have been some of the challenges in those organizations when you've gone in, when all of this makes sense to you, right? Yep. You've lived it, you've breathed it, you've seen it, you've got mm -hmm. awards, you've got these pieces and people come to you and they, they say, oh, I have this issue. I'm fearful of farting in front of somebody I fancy or whatever it might be in the work context. I have this concern. Yeah. Um, how do they tie the concern to your approach your methodologies to helping to, to that what's the the positioning and where you do that i'd be it, really it, fascinated it tends to happen at a senior level right because our our programs i mean we, we train people up cohorts of 12 we do one-to-one -one coaching but currently we have two big big projects that are running 600 people because um, we're not a big company but we are about social impact 
So it generally starts with what is your motivation for this discussion? And it is generally um, too much work, starting to see signs of stress, concerns about well-being. And generally, we will only work with people who are passionate about their people and results. So it's people suffering or results. And then the next question is always, well, what are you doing? And what we tend to hear are things like wellness programs or even mindfulness. You know, I've got nothing against mindfulness, but wellness programs, programs that are focused on eat well, sleep well. Those could get out, exercise. They're wellness, not well-being programs, right? So we hear that. And then I ask, well, what are the consequences of you not getting this right, fixing it? And that's generally when people stop and really think. And it becomes things like talent retention. It becomes things like um, poor leadership and the impact and stress on leadership. It becomes things like productivity down, change, um, running slower or not being able to get through. And that's where our program is unique because we don't come along and tell you anything, right? The way it works is 90-minute sessions with us. We show you some things. And you go off and practice them. Then you come back and we talk some more and we build on them and you go off and practice them. As you're doing that, you get an, a, a, an app, um, you get blogs. And if you're the kind of person that wants to access that, you, know, you can do that. But what we're doing is we're giving those people a tool kit. And the skills come from therapy, leadership, military, um, coaching. But basically what we're doing is giving you the skills to coach yourself through change giving you the language to be able to express yourself and talk about things in ways that you can't so i often think for me um when people when you start to see behavior that isn't isn't contributing to what you want to do it's generally because people are stuck i think people are amazing i don't really think there are many people out there that come to work to really annoy everybody i think people just get stuck right? And what good coaches do, and let me define stuck is you only see one way forward and you don't like it, or you see, uh, or, or you just can't see a way forward. And what all good coaching and good programs do is they give you the skills and the ability and the tools to get that clarity. And if you get that clarity, you get that confidence to commit. So what we're doing is, and it, what's, what makes us unique is we're not doing anything to anybody. We're giving you the skills for you to create and knock down your own barriers and accelerate your own opportunities opportunities and that's what makes it different so with that does come some challenges ross because obviously we agree that up at the kind of at leadership level and then you get to people coming on it and the first big thing we have to get across is and i know this because we've been doing it 10 years the biggest thing is resilience i'm not broken why do i need fixing and we have to work and we have an onboarding process that introduces everybody and goes you need to get your head around resilience is about strength mental, emotional, and social strength. And we're going to show you where you're strong. We're not going to ask you to change. We're going to show you how to leverage your strength, but not overplay them and adapt and flex and look for those areas where you're currently rigid. So you will grow. And that's the link to performance, well-being, and growth. So sometimes it can be a little tricky. You can have some cynics, but we'll say, just go and practice them, experiment and see what you think. I'll tell you a quick funny story if I may. I'm conscious of me. I, I could talk forever is um, once working with a small group of leaders and we did the module on thinking. So we covered what we call thinking traps and understanding your beliefs and attitudes, right? And at the end, we always ask, what's been your most valuable insight? And the person next to me said, too difficult. Second person next to him said, yeah, I agree, too difficult. I'm thinking these are, these are straightforward skills. All of our skills are straightforward, right? Not necessarily easy because you've got to counteract the habit, but straightforward. And then it hit me that these are people who've probably just realized because we've shown them a mirror up in front of them that they've been getting it wrong for some time, but need some time to work it out. So I said, look, I get that you might find it difficult. What I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to try them at home with your family. Just the four skills that we've shown you, try them at home with your family. If you want to give me a call or talk to any of the team, Give us a call. Didn't hear any call, right? And to the credit, they came back the week after because we work intensively for most people. It's week on week. Is um, he's, Both of them came back. And the first one said, I'm just going to say one thing. Um, I work, I, I have, I'm, I'm at home. My family looks like a wife and two daughters. And I tried these skills and they want you to move in with us, please. So it's that, it's, it's that 
preparing people for the role and recognizing that people are amazing. You give them the skills, then generally speaking, they will respond really well. There may be some resistance, which is why our program takes nine weeks, nine modules, and we tap away and give you. Um, it doesn't, you know, you don't, everybody doesn't got this is absolutely brilliant, but we measure all of our stuff and we measure the MPS scores and we measure stress and anxiety. You can feel it and you can see it. So suddenly what happens is if you're not getting it, we give you lots of information that enables you as a team to talk about, you know, for example, 60 of us believe that this, um, these skills can really have a massive difference to our culture, but five of us don't. We need to talk about that in an adult, sensible way. What is it? And it generally comes down to you know, you know uh, something else because the skills are basically what we're showing you is life skills. We intuitively know them. And if I was to sit with you and talk you through them, Ross, you'd probably go, oh, I do that naturally the the art and the skill is in not doing it naturally it's doing it and have been able to recount that skill to somebody else so one of us is ex royal marine special forces he's an inspirational and motivational speaker you know he can talk to you about the time he was up the mountain uh, by himself right and survived but he can't tell you how he did it but he can now he can tell you some 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 skills around it he could just before describe how things came naturally. Does it, that make sense? It absolutely does. And it, it made me think about a, f a few things here because when any of us come into a situation, we will have a perception about it from, from input, uh, past experiences, beliefs, whatever it might be. Someone said something that will help us in our decision-making. Yeah. And we often, when it, it doesn't meet with an expectation, we can't help ourselves, but be in a defensive mode. It's the yeah. way the brain functions. It's the way yeah. it works. Yeah. And that challenge that to create the space for you to allow new input is often hard. You know, you have mentioned a couple of techniques of whether that's change the environment, go and do it with uh, children or use humor uh, with the school children, these things to change our state. And it, it makes me think, actually, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a new Netflix series come out called How to Change Your Mind. It's based on the book of Michael um, Pollan, Polin, I think. And he goes through a lot of um, plant-based uh, things. So the first episode on Netflix is all about LSD. Right. And how that shifted our minds, how, how it works. Next one's uh, psychosyllabin and uh, mushrooms and all sorts of different pieces. And from the early work on LSD before the 60s, so in the 40s and 50s, and there were thousands of research studies going on in Stanford University, all sorts yeah. of things about how it can improve our creativity, how it unlocks a lot of these filters that we put in uh, in our way we cognitively process information to open out. And there was two things that resonated with me uh, in terms of the type of experience you would have. And this is someone, David, I've, you know, never smoked. And uh, I've had one coffee in my life. Um, you know, I'm not yep. in that kind of world. And it was set and setting. And what they meant by that was what was the mindset when you were experiencing this and what was the setting in terms of what was going on around you? And I think yeah. so much is true when we're looking at any kind of training, uh, skills based challenges, things is what is your mindset? What's the setting? And, you know, what is our environment? Who's around us? What's the culture? What's the perceptions? Have I got things like psychological safety? So I think there's so much work that whilst we can have methodologies, we can have these principles, what we often forget, and it's lovely to hear from you, is the, the importance of ensuring that we have the setting right. You know, you talked about onboarding or just creating the environment for thinking differently, creating the environment for a cognitive shift of those things. And I'm just fascinated by, you know, what you've shared already seems to align very much with that. Yeah, and look, I think a lot of a lot of what I see in the corporate world. And bear in mind, I was on the other side of the fence. I would have been deciding whether we put this into our business and to what extent, and signing it off. Is what I see a lot about interventions is it's like trying to take um, a goldfish in a dirty bowl 
and deciding to clean it by lifting it out of the dirty bowl, putting it in a clean bowl for a while, and then putting it back in the dirty bowl. That's what a lot of training does. That's what a lot of L&D does. I'm, and no disrespect to my L&D colleagues. I have some, some of my friends now are going to be telling me off. Um, but that's what happens. It's like doing that. So you're changing the content of thinking, but you're not necessarily changing the context. Uh, and it's what, it's what frustrates the hell out of me about, about theory-based training. Because I, I love a good bit of theory, right? I love, a, I love a good bit of theory. But certainly what happens with resilience and what I've seen is uh, generally speaking, if it's developed in house, generally speaking, it will be half an hour, lunch and learn. There'll be some stories about overcoming adversity and then go chin up, off you go. So what you do is you create a context where people want to learn. They want to be resilient. They know that they need to be resilient, right? And people who are keen to progress and grow and manage and get the best out of people, they're going to look for, well, how do I be resilient? And all you've got to be able to find on the internet is theory. Right, so you're creating and perpetuating the problem. You're saying you need to be more resilient. People understand, okay, I get that. I understand the benefits of being more resilient. And then they go try to find the answer and they can't. So they get more frustrated and add more stress into it. And we, we find that hugely frustrating. It's what a lot of people say about our program. I love it because it's skills-based. So, I, I mean, I'm a professional coach. So really, the only real things that you can change are content and context. And what a lot of coaching does is it creates that space. It was a good word, Ross. It creates that space for people to explore the, their context and their content of their thinking and the perception and the link between the two. And what a good coach does, in my view, is creates that space to get clarity, clarity of thought around context and content. If you've got that clarity, you have the confidence to commit. That's the secret. That's my secret anyway, when I'm when I'm coaching. So it's not, it's the interplay between yeah. The two, and we don't exist in a vacuum, yet we bring yeah. interventions in that kind of suggest that we do. It's kind of what I like about some of, like, like your profile. It creates a space for people to examine the content of the thoughts. Do I really look like that? Do I really come across like that? I don't come across like that. Okay, well, why don't you go ask the people around you and see whether you do or not? And is it a case of you are not self-aware? Or is it a case that you you um, are not like that and it's wrong? But often I find with good quality profiles like yourself and some of the things that we use is they are generally right in some context. And it's that constant shift. And I think that's what's, what's accelerated now. So what's accelerated now is uh, there's a great book by Alvin Toffler called Future Shock. And he, he wrote in the 70s, he basically, the future shock is we'll have so much choice, so much information, we'll be shocked into indecision. The whole context has changed. When I said to my, my dad, I'm going to join the Resilience Development Company, in his Yorkshire accent, he said, why do you want to do that, son? Aren't you already resilient? And I said to him, look, dad, you've got to think about it this way, is for me, for you, you, you get this. You read the same paper. You lived in the same house all your life. You go to the same pub with the same friends every Thursday and you do the same things. Compare that to my life. Think about how many houses I've lived in, how many jobs I've done, how many geographical moves I've done. It's completely different. Yeah. And it's completely so will the different. next generation and the next one mm -hmm. is that the context is shifting so radically um, in terms of what we've experienced in our lives to what will be experienced in the next 10 years. Mm. Um, I remember Ray Kurzweil, um, who's a chief futurist at uh, Google. He was one of the co-founders at Singularity University talking about exactly that. You know, we'll see more change in the next 10 years than we will in the previous 100. And this accelerating effect is just, that's exhausting, right? <laughs> you know, and this, this yeah. challenge of, um being able to be comfortable in the uncomfort to yeah. not see it as a problem but to see it as the water in which we swim yeah and so it is and that is perspective so it, it comes i've got a couple of questions i wanted to touch on and one was what's the opposite of resilience mm, now this is really interesting because i hear people say it's anti-fragility Right. I would say it's, it's I would say the opposite of resilience. It's a good question. I'm going to think for a moment. 
if resilience is the ability to positively adapt to change, right? The opposite of it has to be stuck in the mud, no change, struggling. Um, it has to be unproductive, unwell, not um, growing. Collapse. Kind yeah. Of, you know, a, a state of decline, of corrosion. It's interesting, isn't it, when we try to have these mental thought experiments and models of things and we spend so much time in one area having that paradox uh, as you were talking about a future scenario planning what's the best that can happen what's the worst that can happen you know when we're in a certain way of doing a certain way of thinking mm. often to just have that shock of well what's the opposite of that can really get us into a state of yeah. curiosity, a state of thought, a state of reflection. Yeah. It's and I think it's an effective tool sometimes for people when they're faced with something for you. Oh, my passion, it's resilience, everything all about this. And well, what's a life without resilience? Yeah. Um, and I, I just find it there's you know, a great, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. There's a great bit on our website, right? I've got to say this because it's something we're passionate about. We don't talk about mental health yet. We're all mental health advocates on our programs. We don't talk about mental health, uh, but you can have a little look on our website. It's about our social impact. So basically um, we ask seven questions at the beginning, at the end, right? Um, amongst others, seven questions that if you went into a doctor today and said you were stressed, they would ask you um, these seven questions. And if you scored over 10, they would then, they use it as a screening tool. They would then refer you on to perhaps CAMS or they might talk about tablets, but we're not doctors and we're not doing any screen. These are just seven brilliant questions, right? If you score over 10 though, in a medical context, it's about moving on job broadly before COVID. And we've trained thousands of people and have a big database. It was about one in four, one in four. So. Of the people that we've trained, the thousands of people, one in four were above 10, right? To start with, scary, because these are not people in doctors, right? Post-COVID, it's got a little higher. It might be where the one in four of us um, suffer poor mental health start comes from. What's interesting, Ross, is what's really interesting is after a program that is nine modules of 90 minutes, that drops massively. It doesn't matter who we're doing it with. And we measure stress as well. So stress is, is, is how you think about the pressure that you're under. You can generally see somebody that's stressed. Anxiety is how you feel about it. You can't often see that. We measure both of those and they come down. So I would say at a very big high level, Ross, right? The opposite of resilience is a life with lots of anxiety, lots of stress. In other words, and they are indicators of potential poor mental health. And then what I would do is I take it one step higher and say, if we need to be productive, if our society is based on productive people, there is no wealth without health, no wealth without health. So if I follow that through and I think about it on a bigger scale, I would say without resilience, we have some big issues. The opposite is, the opposite is heavy workloads, toxic culture, poor management, increasing mental health, impacting productivity oh surprise surprise isn't that where we are now and we kind of come circular back to it we're not taught this stuff in yeah. schools and i'll just make a link to i mean i love technology right iphone love it right we're on iphone 14 15 something like that when was the last time we upgraded our brains yeah because we know all this stuff coaches counseling we, we know it all we just go to them when we need it we should be teaching it in schools and we have done and seen similar results. And that corrosive nature, you know, of our stress hormone neurotransmitters and responses of cortisol, of adrenaline, these deplete our brain cells. Absolutely. You know, so as a chronic situation of existing in that state over a long period of time, it reduces our ability to function. So yes. some of it is very helpful. It was yep. primal there, but we can't distinguish between something that's a real threat and just a thought threat. Exactly. Our body reacts in exactly the same way uh, of those things. So if we, we come full circle, you mentioned something really early on in our conversation about curiosity being one of your um, passions, superpowers, and something that you, you love to do. One of my, I think it might've been my first, certainly early 
uh, interviews was with a lady called uh, Diane Hamilton, Dr. Diane Hamilton. She wrote the Curiosity Index, uh, the code, all sorts of things around curiosity. And it sparked at that midpoint in the series of the this podcast, a question which was, when was the last time you did something for the first time and what was it? So I want to pose that question to you, David, and see what your thoughts are in response. When was the last time you did right. something for the first time? Yeah. And what was it? That's really easy because we've just launched our first podcast. Went up yesterday. Fantastic. Can, can I mention it? Am I allowed to? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's Resilience Development Podcast. It's available wherever you find your post podcast. And it's got quite a broad remit, actually. It kind of takes us full circle. So it's me and the team talking to interesting people uh, and, and exploring how people live better, work better and feel better. Because that's what we think resilience skills give you, the, the ability to do that. So it's talking to interesting people just about the strategies and the tools. Because I think if you get behind people, everybody's got a really interesting story. And I am very curious, right? I, I, I know I'm a curious person. I'm so interested in people. I didn't used to be. I, would have, I wouldn't have made um, small talk. I'm an introvert by nature. I'm just a confident one. I never used to be, though, right? I just learned to, to do it. And what I found from being a coach and working with people is everybody's so so amazing and and the thing that really consolidated it for me was um i came out of h boss and i came into lloyd's banking group and somebody described me as the antichrist in my new team i was like what do you mean they said well look at you look how young you are most of your peers are about 15 years older than, than you um you're definitely not a banker i was like thank you well, you are you're, okay i'm definitely not a, not a, a banker and i'm a blue it's like, what do you mean blue? She said, well, I'm Lloyd's. I said, what? Do you mean, are you talking about Lloyd's TSB merging? Yeah. How long ago was that? 20 years ago. And you still identify like that? Yeah. Okay. So, and then my point is this, is uh, when, when those two companies merged, right, there was a lot of tension and there were a lot of people that weren't happy. A lot of people that were happy. And some people weren't happy because the share price and the pensions had crashed. Yeah, right and there were loss. yeah real big difficult and some people it really upset me because some people have been there 20 years and they want to just leave quietly and there was no way i was going to let them do that after 20 years of kind of bringing it but this is my point is i've worked with some extraordinary people ross some extraordinary people but the most extraordinary people i've ever worked with are the ones at Lloyd, lloyd's banking group in the financial crisis going through all of that and still coming to work Still coming to work, still getting up, still being positive, still wanting to build something, still wanting to focus on the content and not derail things yet with a context that was absolutely awful around them. And that was the that was a big change for me. I suddenly started to just realize how amazing people are. So for example, you know, when you look at things like our website, our podcast, I I you my team have to sometimes wind me back and go, we like it but we need to go a little slower. But um, generally speaking, generally speaking, I can always answer that question. What have I done for the first first time? And when was it? But to answer the question directly, it was the, the podcast. And it, it was about satisfying curiosity and getting yeah. interesting people in to talk and just tell the story. It's a fab way to learn. And I still take everyone. I think we're on maybe 80 episodes now. Oh, wow. Everyone is just a a discovery of learning of curiosity, hanging out with great minds. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a final piece, if there was, so focus on resilience, you have your various methods and uh, principles of your flow of pace. And you mentioned 65 sort of sub skills that you work in this yep. very how to practical level. Yep. If there was a couple of teasers, a couple of little tips that you could give people that might be, you know, leading a team at the moment, in an organization where they've recognized some uh, things, they might have been given an initiative or been thinking about an initiative to help uh, with some of their challenges by the type of work that you do, David. What would be a couple of those tips? And once you've shared those, share how do people best get in touch with you? A couple of tips, I would say, uh, look, we're coming up to, we're coming up to holiday season, aren't we? All right. So we tend to, you know, Rest and recharge is, is essential for performance and productivity and, and well-being. 
but we kind of almost we kind of almost don't see any value in not being busy so i would say if you are a leader you need to create permission for people to rest but you need to think about it across four dimensions not just the one that we tend to think about one of it is like physical rest well we all know that when we go on holiday we tend to lay back and sit down you know if you're resting physically Go do something that enables you to rest, like um, massage or do yoga. But then you need that mental rest. It's about giving your brain a break. Switch off your phone. Disconnect from it. Take that mental rest. Read a book. Listen to music, but leave the phone elsewhere. The third one is emotional rest. It's about being authentic and honest with yourself. Um, So sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we're constantly pleasing people, and we have to project a particular image. I know that being an introvert is you have to kind of give yourself permission to have that emotional rest, to break off from that. And then the second one is, social, fourth one, sorry, social rest. And for some people, it's about engaging with those social connections that really fill them with positivity that they haven't had a chance to do. For others, it's about closing the doors and switching the curtains down. So that, that is what I would say to anybody is create permission for people to take a rest, but think about it physically, mentally, emotionally and socially so it's kind of four four in there but just in that that one and then i would say uh, where people can find us that easy resilience training.co.uk uh, and i'd say specifically resilience training.co.uk forward slash articles because our, we have a blog on there articles that are full of skills based advice uh, and if anybody wants to connect to me on linkedin um twitter all the usual we're on all of that as well Fantastic, David. It's been a real pleasure to begin our journey together. I'm sure there's lots of opportunity for collaborations that we will discover throughout our journeys of aligned missions. Thank you for taking this seriously, for coming as a true, authentic self, David. I've enjoyed our first session, and here's to many more. Thanks, David. It's been an absolute pleasure, Ross. Thank you very much. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQME assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.